Good morning, everyone. It's nice to see uh, faces here at this presentation. My name's Francis, and I've been working or volunteering with Austin Pets Alive since 2009. Um, I've had a number of different roles, probably like all of you. I've been fostering, I've been a foster manager, a foster mentor, but my main role, my main passion has been on the rescue team. And so I'm gonna talk to you today a little bit about what tools and tricks and things we've learned as we've gone through this process from the very beginning. Okay. So I don't know how many of you are actively doing rescue at the shelters right now um, and have you know, seen the euthanasia lists, but typically you've got faces looking at you as you pick up that list, you go and visit the cats. And so we're gonna come back to this um, example a little bit later in the presentation, but I kinda want you to picture these four cats. Uh, you've got Anthony over there, um, really super outgoing Tom cat that just wants to climb on your shoulder and, and, and love on you, but he's got FIV. And you've got Kinsey down here, a beautiful Siamese. She's obviously owned, but it's come in as a stray, but she's vomiting and she's got some sort of medical issues going on. You're not quite sure what's happening. And you've got Violet up there on the left, um, who's a nursing mum with six kittens. And they're probably a little unsocial, a little bit hissy. So you've got your work cut out for you on that one. And then, whoops. And then lastly, you've got this lovely little pair, Walter and Willie, who are an owner's surrender. They're extremely shy. They used to hide under the bed. Um, and, uh, and at the shelter, they're not doing very well at all. So, but in reality, you're not just got four faces looking at you. <clears throat> You've got another four, another four, and another four. And as a rescue person, it can become very overwhelming. How do you help save all these lives? So the whole purpose of this presentation is really to help you um, focus on the best ways to saving as many lives as possible. Just to give you a little bit of perspective, um, I'm going to give you a, a then and now where APA started on the cat rescue team and where we are now. Um, so we'll just run through that quickly. So we started in late 2008, and at the time there were just two of us uh, going in, evaluating cats every day, seven days a week, come rain or shine. And it was a big job um, because we were also volunteers. Um, every night we would have maybe 20 to 30 cats to evaluate. And we were very limited in what we could do in terms of saving cats. We were only allowed to maybe put holds on four cats of that list of 30. So it was, it was tough, and you had to sort of have to make some decisions. The other thing that was limiting for us was we, we had a foster group, but it, we were only maybe 20 people. So we were, uh, had a very, very small gang. <laughs> um, now we have the luxury in 2015 that the city is now a no-kill shelter, so that's a huge plus. Um, we've got five evaluators covering over the, the course of the week, which kind of um, evens the workload out. We have between five and 20 cats now on our list, and we have the ability to work with every cat on that list. We don't, we're not just limited to those first four that we're trying to prioritize on. And then um, the other cool thing is as APA has grown, we've got a really large foster base. So we're now at 150 active fosters, and we also have uh, several different cattery sites for adoption sites. So we have lots of different places for those cats to go. And lastly, um, which has uh, re really been great um, as a rescue volunteer, we've been able to develop additional programs for the special cats. I'm talking about the feline leukemia cats, the ringworm cats, the hard to place cats. So that's really, really helped us as a, as a program develop. And just to give you kind of uh, some perspective of where we started. So 2008, we rescued 40 cats. We started, I think, in November of 2008. We were able to pull from the shelter 40 cats. In 2009, which was a super year because we rescued nearly 800 cats, um, we still left behind a lot. So it was a tough year as a rescue team. Um, but you can see uh, over the course of the years, we've, we're now averaging maybe about 2,000 cats a year. That includes bottle babies, and this number here re just represents the animals we pulled from the Austin City Shelter. It doesn't include the other ones that we pulled later um, in, over, the, over the years. We've been able to pull from other areas too. So just some kind of cool stats. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna talk a bit about how, how we got started, kind of give you some ideas around that, and we'll get into the real nuts and bolts, the, the fun stuff in a bit. Um, our current APA organization is set up in this way. So we have the city shelter that has all the cats on their euthanasia list. We have our rescue team that go into the shelter to do the evaluations. And then we have a number of different, what I call outlets for those cats. 
So we have a foster program, a bottle baby program, a barn placement program, uh, a cattery, feline leukemia ward, and a ringworm ward. So we have a number of different outlets. But for this presentation, I am wanting to focus on those new organizations that are starting off on the, on the euthanasia list. So um, you're typically going to have maybe one rescue person and a small foster base. So the rest of the presentation is based on how you, how you save cats in that scenario. The first thing, obviously, is to, you've got to set up communication with the shelter. And um, so the first thing we did, uh, Dr. Jefferson and some other key people um, started talking with the shelter to negotiate our access to their euthanasia list. It took a while to even establish that, but once we did, um, then, we, then we could start figuring out how that list worked. So you needed to talk with the shelter, understand their abbreviations, their coding, that kind of thing, where they write deadlines on their lists and that kind of stuff. Um, and then once you understand that process, you can develop your own program process. Um, the key thing we found was that it was really important to have uh, usually one contact person representing the rescue team to liaise with the, the, the shelter. If you've got five or six different volunteers on the rescue team that are talking to five or six different staff at the shelter, uh, there's going to be miscommunication. So we really recommend one contact person with a backup in case that person needs to go on vacation, for instance, or you know, get, get fall sick. <clears throat> the next thing you need to do is to set up your own internal program communication. So we determined a rescue lead when we had more than one volunteer. Um, so that person was kind of responsible for the team. And then um, some other things we did, we actually created an email alias for our group because all the volunteers that are part of the rescue team follow those cats. They want to, they want to, they may have visited that cat that day and they want to understand what happened the following day and, and so on and what the plan is for that cat. So we have an email alias that circulates every day telling us what the, the updates. <clears throat> We also have an emergency phone list, and I'll give you an example of when that was needed. Um, so we have all, pe all the people, kind of the, the foster managers, the people responsible for bringing the cats out of the shelter into their program. And um, there are a number of times when I turned up at the shelter to do my evaluations, we had what we call confirmed on a cat. We were agreed we were going to take it by 5 p.m. that day, and the shelter closes at 7, and I turn up at 6, and the, the cat hasn't been picked up. And then there's this mad scramble because the cat has a deadline, needs to get out of the shelter by seven, you pick up the phone, and that's the way for the cat to get out. Um, we also have developed a format uh, for reporting, and I'll show you some examples of that. So it's nice to have a single um, format for, for your report, so it's easy for the person who's making those decisions to run through them e uh, quickly and easily. And then, some, as we've grown, we've developed a Google Calendar for scheduling, so p people know who's going to the shelter on what days. And then, um, we also set, set, set ground rules for our team. And an example of that would be, we, re we require our team to submit their reports by 9 o'clock every night, which gives the person who's making the final decisions some time that evening to... Um, to, to evaluate the, the reports. So the, the, those are the kind of ground rules we have. All right, so let's get on to the working the list. This is kind of the how-to part that I think um, hopefully you'll, you'll get some um, good ideas from. <clears throat> I think every shelter might um, have a different way of evaluating their cats. But the cats that typically ended up on our list, especially in the early days, Fall in, fell into two categories. Either they were behavior related or they were medically, medical related. Um, some shelters may decide that every cat that's waited at stray time only has you know, X number of days, and so you might see every kind of cat on your list. But for us, it was behavior or medical. Um, the types of issues that we would get were litter box issues, aggression, and not surprisingly, a lot of those were declawed cats. Um, we get cats that are rough players. Sorry, this is on a... Needs to be on a loop. Um, we get cats that are rough players, or they were quick to arouse. They turn around and grab onto you. Um, they may be hard to handle. They may be really terrified in the shelter and just not doing well. Um, withdrawn. We've got protective nursing mums and unsocialized kittens. Then the other kinds of issues we had were medically related. So you might have cats that had broken legs, uh, needed a tail amputated, maybe had an eye injury. Um, or they may have chronic medical issues. That was typically the older cats. They may have diabetes or renal failure, that kind of thing. Um, and then, of course, you've got 
I don't know how common it is with you guys, but we have a, we have a lot of ringworm that comes in, um, feline leukemia positive cats, FIV positive cats, and cats with upper respiratory infection. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you about that in a little bit. But th those are the kinds of cats that end up on our list. There are other factors that will influence what your list looks like too. Different times of the year, you may get different um, numbers of cats on your list. So things to consider are the kitten season. So here, it starts maybe March and goes till about September, October. Maybe the bottle, someone on the bottle baby team is here, but they'll probably say, no, 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 it's year round now. But um, kitten season uh, really will, st you'll start to see a, a large number of cats on your list. Um, the other thing to bear in mind is um, often the shelters receive hoarding cases. So they'll have a large intake of cats all in one go. And while those cats may be um, safe for a while, the cats that are already at the shelter need to go somewhere and they'll end up on your list. So that's something to bear in mind. <clears throat> We've been able to work with the shelter a little bit and get a heads up often that you know, in a couple of days' time, uh, we've, we're going to have a case come in, so we can start working ahead of time, but you may or may not know that. Other things that can influence um, your list are disease outbreaks. So I mentioned URI. In 2009 and 2010, it was rampant in the shelter. Every cat that came in seemed to get it, and they'd all end up on our list. So that's something to bear in mind. And then, of course, Holidays, you've got um, lots of cats bring, being brought in. There's large intake on round holidays and, um, of course, natural disasters. So those are some things to bear in mind. Okay, so I wanted to run through how we go about evaluating our cats and kind of give you an idea of what that looks like. So we'll go every, every day. We'll ask for the euthanasia list, and it's different every day. And they'll usually accompany that with not just the ID numbers of the cats, but we'll actually get notes on what, what, why the cat is on that list. We'll determine the order of evaluations. So by that, I mean we'll, pro we'll figure out which cats we're going to visit first. We want to go from the healthy cats to the sickest cats. You don't want to be spreading any disease. So um, we, we kind of look at, look at your, your list as far as you can tell and, and, and then go and make your, your order of evaluations that way. You probably want to start with kittens first as well um, because their immune system is, is less than an adult cat. <clears throat> then the next thing we do is we review the notes. We review the shelter notes, we review the owner's notes and our own team's previous evaluations. The shelter notes are usually going to be pretty short and they're probably not going to be terribly positive because the cat is on your list. So just bear that in mind. The owner surrender notes, if there are any, um, that's really interesting. I take a lot of the reason why they, they're bringing the cat in with a pinch of salt because I don't think people are necessarily always truthful um, about that reason. But what it does give you the opportunity to know is if that cat's lived with other cats, other dogs, kids, that kind of thing. Is it an indoor-outdoor cat? So you can match that cat to a foster. Then I always advise our evaluators to look at the cat before you open the kennel door. <laughs> Seems like an intuitive thing, but we've often, um, you, you, you can see sometimes that some cats are ready to bolt right out of there, so you don't want that situation. Um, so have a look, see what the cat's doing before you stick your hand in. And then we assess behavior and personality, we'll assess their condition, and, um, and then at the end of that, we'll go back to the shelter staff and submit what we call our holds list, so the cats we're interested in. <clears throat> okay, just a quick, some quick tips on things that I find useful, um, what I have in my toolkit and what a lot of our evaluators do. Obviously, I take a notebook and pen so I can make my observations, especially um, my memory is terrible, and if I've got 30 cats to look at on the list, I need to write some notes. Um, the other thing is I actually carry uh, a list of names. Um, some people carry a baby book, because after looking at thousands of cats now, I'm not very creative when it comes to naming, and it's important to give a cat a name if, if it doesn't have one. So a baby book is always useful. Uh, I take a camera. I take a small little handheld camera. Um, doesn't cost very much because, one, it can drop on the floor and smash because it's usually concrete that we're, we're walking on, um, and two, it's a public area and, and things go missing. So I, I just keep a very uh, cheap camera with me. Some of my evaluators are using smartphones. They can also take video. Um, the one 
toy that I find is like, if I had to pick any of these, I would take my straw toy with me. And you can see that in the picture. It's really simple, just a, to a straw with a, um, some wool through it and knots at the other, uh, either end. And um, you can use this a number of different ways. Um, you can use it with kittens to, to play with. Um, you can use it as what I was doing, trying to do here to get their attention so you can take a nice shot. Um, they'll, if, you, if you hold it up high, they'll often look up and you can take a good shot because you're usually on your own doing all this. So you've got the straw toy in one hand and the camera in the other. Um, <clears throat> and the other really good use of that straw toy is an extension of your hand. If you're concerned about a cat maybe lashing out or you're not comfortable but you kind of want to give it a go, you can use that straw toy um, like a, a pencil um, and uh, you can start play, uh, like rubbing across the back of the head, around the ears, under the chin. If it's going really well, I slide that, pet, that down and then I can use my hand and it's kind of, it just is an easy way in um, <clears throat> when, you're, when you're a little bit maybe apprehensive about how that cat's gonna react to you. We also use feel away um, with really stressed cats. Uh, you can either spray it on the towel or what we found useful is also spraying it on a woolen glove and then stroking the cat. Um, usually you want to give that about five or ten minutes before um, you interact, give it a little time. Feel away is a stress appeasing pheromone, so it's supposed to lower stress levels. <clears throat> and then the other thing that um, is useful if a cat is not really wanting to come out, sorry, if a cat isn't wanting to come out, um, often fancy feast is a really good way to tempt them out. Uh, sometimes, you know, that's kind of their, their um, uh, weakness, let's say, um, it's usually often quite a good way to, to get the cat to come out. All right, so moving on, down to behavior. So you are the eyes and ears for the team. You, you're the person that's actually seeing the cat and able to report to everybody else who's gonna make the decision about where that cat goes. So there are a number of things that we do as a team to report on behavior. And um, <clears throat> just to keep it simple, um, you're looking about how that cat acts when you first approach it, um, whether it lets you touch it, uh, is it vocalizing, and that can be signs of you know, distress, for instance, or maybe it's a, a, um, a stress response. Um, can you handle the cat? Uh, is it showing any signs of stress or, or threat? And are there any positive behaviors that you can report on too? So, um, for, for example, when you, when you go to open up the kennel, does the, does the cat come straight out? Typically, the cats on my list don't. <laughs> They're the shyer ones, um, the more reserved ones. Um, but <clears throat> describe, you want to describe to the person how they initially react to that. Um, we have handling on here. You can see we're talking about can the cat be easily picked up. I know a lot of cats do not like to be picked up, but our um, medical team find it useful to know how easy that cat is to handle. And that also helps them figure out, you know, if the cat gets sick, uh, um, is a foster able, going to be able to um, give medical a treatment or does it need to go to a medical foster? Um, and then uh, signs of stress. I just wanted to, I'm not sure um, how familiar everyone is, but lip licking is a sign that they're really, really stressed. And I see that a lot in owner surrendered cats that, you know, are 10 years old, never been anywhere, and then they are dumped at the shelter. So um, we'll see that a lot, and you just go very slowly with them and maybe give them feel away and talk to them and just go slow. And then we try and kind of describe, give descriptors to the cat. Uh, is it bold and confident or is it really shy and reserved? And some cats uh, um, act indifferent, especially for the first few days. They'll just sit there, they don't, they'll let you touch them, but they're not really responding in a positive way. So um, these are all things that help us understand how that cat is at that time. <clears throat> so on the medical front, none of us are vets or vet techs that do this, um, but you can report uh, what you're seeing. So you can report any symptoms. So ears, eyes and nose, um, do they have itchy ears? Are they, have they got um, a discharge, eye discharge? Are they sneezing? Have they got green snot coming out? That kind of stuff. Um, you can also report on um, a body condition. Are they really, really emaciated or are they super obese? Just to give an idea, because there are different, thing, different medical issues associated with either end of that spectrum. Um, the coat condition, if there's hair loss, even if you're not sure if it's ringworm, it's a good thing to flag it with a team. 
so that's something that they can bear in mind. Their appetite, um, and I wanted to talk about social eaters. I find a lot of the cats that are owner surrender again um, tend to not eat in front of you until you've done some sort of petting and stroking. So you'll often see food untouched, but you go in at the end of the day and you interact with that cat and all of a sudden it stands up and goes to the, goes to the, the food. And so that's something to bear in mind, especially if you're um, give, bringing that cat to a new foster, to tell them, you know, don't just put the food out, interact with it a little bit beforehand because a cat that doesn't eat, is, that's, that's not a good thing. Um, we look at litter box action, are they using it? Uh, are there any concerns about bowel movements, about peeing, that kind of stuff? And then we're also looking at pain behavior, if there is any. So I don't know if you remember Kenzie, the little um, Siamese in that photo that we looked at. She was sitting hunched over like this with a uh, little four feet uh, tucked under her. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> um, and so that would be a sign that the, the cat is uncomfortable, uh, possibly in pain. So we look for all those kinds of things and report on that. Okay. So the other thing to remember is while you're there doing evaluations, there are a couple of opportunities that arise as, as you're doing this. The first is that um, often when I was at the shelter, there were very few staff around, and I'd be interacting with these cats in this room, and adopters would walk in, and they'd start asking me questions. Oh, what's that cat story? You know, um, are they, that doesn't need to be adopted. They may not be interested in the cat that you're looking at, but you can show them other cats, and often, they'll walk away, you put the cat in their arms and they start falling in love. So um, that's a, a good opportunity because that means that there's an extra life that's just been saved as a result of you just being there and being open and having the time to spend with them. The other thing is that, uh, and this has sort of, um, sort of evolved organically, is that it's an opportunity to start socializing kittens. Um, we'll often have uh, those little spitfires that you, I'm sure you've seen. Um, on our list and what I found is if you work with them for even 15 minutes a day for three days um, They turn around especially if they're, they're really young like six weeks seven week olds They'll turn around and then you can go back to the shelter and say can you reevaluate this cat this kitten? And they're like oh, yeah, it's totally adoptable and they'll take it off your list So that's another way to, to think about things Okay, on the evaluations our wrap-up basically we are going to make notes on all our observations we take photos of all the cats, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, if there's any concerns that we're seeing with a cat, m usually medical concerns, we'll um, report them to the staff uh, because we want those animals to be looked at. And then we talk to the staff about which cats we're interested in putting holds on. Um, if their cat doesn't have a name, you want to name it. It's really important for that cat to have a name. If you're doing foster please, if you're doing Craigslist, that cat needs a name. And then um, we also ask for a kennel count to get a, an idea of space that night. Um, and that's really important as we're playing sort of the, you've got sort of all these moving pieces and, and it's a bit of a jigsaw and it's good to know how stretched the shelter is that night um, for the person that's making the decisions on bringing cats into the program. Once we've wrapped up at the shelter, then we go home, we write our reports and then we'll submit our report to our rescue alias and that from that point our rescue manager or the foster manager they often have the same role will decide <clears throat> um, will decide uh, who they're going to pull so that gets, gets submitted before nine o'clock every night okay I talked about um, our, how we evaluate and, and, and submit our reports so there's some key information as a rescue manager or a foster manager you want um, to assess the suitability of the cat for your program. So this is one of the reports from our a, a, a team, a rescue team. So we put important information right at the top, the name, the ID, the kennel number, uh, the coloration of the cat, how old the cat is, and any pertinent information. In this instance, it's probably really small for you to see, but this cat has feline leukemia, she's tested positive. Um, we'll also give photos, and um, we'll talk about her interactions with the team. And here's another example. It's important to call out uh, as a team member um, important inform information for the rescue manager because often they're skimming. If you've got 30 cats you've got to look at that night, you're often having to skim a lot. Um, so we try and keep the descriptions fairly small, uh, short, but um, we'll call out. Uh, in this instance, Miriam is diabetic, but um, she was given an original deadline of 11.29 and now it's been extended a day. So that's really important for the foster manager to understand. 
And then um, the last thing you do with these evaluations is you can use them um, to create your own foster pleas with your, within your own program. Um, you can use those photos. Photos uh, speak a thousand words. Um, and you can also use them for other things, uh, marketing later. They may not be the most fantastic photos, but at least it's a start for your database. So, <clears throat> as the foster manager, how do you choose cats for your program? So this is gonna be the, the hardest part, I think, for a lot of people. The questions you need to ask yourself is what space you have, and be realistic about that. So typically, you're probably gonna be full. <laughs> you may have one or two openings. You may know of an adoption event coming up. So you need to understand what space you have. You also need to know how varied your cat population is. And by that, I'm talking about, do you have a good mix of age, color, coat length, and breed? Um, or are you heavy loaded with uh, a particular group of cats? At one point, I think it was in 2010, we had a look at our cat inventory. This was before we were really kind of getting into it. Um, and we realized that we had probably about 45 to 50% of the kittens were black. And we know that black cats are hardest to adopt. And so we really kind of had to reevaluate what we were doing so we could move those cats because as the kittens grow, they become those gangly teenagers and then become adults. And so we needed to reevaluate kind of who we were pulling into the program. So that's a t this is a tough one. Um, but the idea is that you try and keep everything varied so that adopters have the whole gamut to look at. Um, also ask yourself how many adoptions do you think you're going to have this week or this month? Uh, that can be a little bit hard to predict, but maybe you have a kind of an idea on that front. And then are you expecting any large influx of, of cats at the shelter in the next month so, or in the next week? So maybe you heard about a hoarding case or maybe kitten season's just about to start, so you need to kind of bear that in mind. <clears throat> then you've got to determine which cats you think you can bring into the program. This presentation is killing me. <laughs> okay. So, um, of the cats that you've been presented with as a rescue manager, you, what we've done is we would number them in terms of order of saving for that night. And this is the tough bit. So, you're looking for fast adoptions, okay? And you have to consider some priorities. So, as a team, we agreed that the priorities um, would be kittens over adults, litters or pairs over individuals, because you're saving more lives that way, um, highly desirable features, so any purebreds, any declaws, manxes, anything unique, like a um, three-legged cat or a one-eyed cat, um, anything unique is something that people kind of latch onto. So a high, highly desirable features, and then healthy animals over sick animals. Now that's not to say you can't take all of those animals, but it's a way of helping you prioritize. And of the cats that you don't bring into your program, there are, those, are some other options, and we'll talk about them in a second. <clears throat> so here we back at our working example. So you remember Anthony, he's the FIV cat, but he's super outgoing, and he's just, he's just an absolute doll. And you've got Kinsey, he's super sweet, but she's really not feeling so great, but she's a Siamese, and she's clearly owned by someone, but she came in as a stray. And you've got Violet, who's a protective nursing mom, and she's got these little kittens that are about five weeks old, and they're like, a little bit hissy, don't know about people. And then you've got Walter and Willie, who are this super shy pair. Um, their owner notes indicate they're really shy in the home, and now they're here in the shelter. And they're probably not going to be great if they go straight to an adoption event. They're probably not going to show themselves really well at an adoption event. So when we talk about ordering, this is what we would do for this particular night. We'd pull Violet first, because that's seven lives you can save in one go. The kittens are young enough, they're cute enough, they'll probably fly out the door in terms of adoptions. Then we take Kinsey, uh, because she's a Siamese, and, um, uh, and then we would go with Walter and Willie as the, the shy pair, because two is better than the last guy, Anthony, as number four. Now, this may change the next day. You may get a whole lot, bunch of other cats on the list, and you might put Anthony as number one. But, um, you're always having to kind of reevaluate. We never kind of stick with the one, two, three, or four order. We always, every night, look to see do we want to move this, this cat up higher priority or do we want to move this one down lower? So it, it's a really tough uh, situation, but you kind of have to work through it logically. 
Okay, so it's never an easy job. Um, you need to know your CAT program, what we call the CAT inventory. Um, you need to know what your limiting resources are, which are typically foster space. Um, you've got to remember to pick CATs for fast adoptions, because fast adoptions mean more lives saved. <clears throat> okay, so what about those other CATs that are sitting there? The, the 16 others that you can't pull into your program, what do you do about them? So I've got some other ways that we have found that work for us. They don't always work, but it's something to keep in the back of your mind. So, so for stray cats, um, have a look and see if there's a sign of a collar. You know, often they'll get like a, a little bit of um, uh, missing hair around the collar if they've had a collar. Uh, is their coat in really good condition, is super glossy? If it's a long-haired cat, maybe it's been groomed really well. Are they declawed? If that's the case, they're probably a lost cat, and you can check on Craigslist. Um, have a look to see what's, who's posting that they've lost somebody. Um, then you can also put found and put your own post out there with a photo because you've got that from your, your rescue team. Um, and then put in that Craigslist post the neighborhood that that cat was found in. Um, don't put the street, don't be too specific because people might not think it's um, their cat. Or, and don't make, make it so vague like putting Austin because people, <laughs> people um, probably will gloss over that. And then if you're part of that neighborhood itself, you could send an email to your listserv or your neighborhood watch group list and see if anybody's missing a kitty. Um, owner surrendered cats. So this is an interesting one. We have actually gone and contacted owners to tell them that their cat that they've surrendered to the shelter is at risk. And we have a conversation with them. Sometimes it doesn't go so great. Sometimes it's really helpful. Um, sometimes they're in a position where they, cu they couldn't afford to do a treatment for a cat. Maybe they had some dental problems and they're just like, I can't afford this. But there are assistance programs out there and we tell them about that. And we've had a number of cats um, actually become, be, be reclaimed and move out um, back to their homes and get, get that assistance. Um, if the owner's not willing to reclaim, which probably is 90% of the time, um, <clears throat> you can gain more insight if they're willing to talk to you about what the situation was that cat was coming from. In the notes, it doesn't really give you a lot to, to go on, so you may find out um, you know, that the cat's been peeing in all these different places, but they never tried different litter box, uh, litter box um, types or that sort of thing. So you can gain, gain some more information from them that way. The other thing you can do is you can post on Craigslist, and there's probably more technologies out there that you can um, um, source into now, but this is what we were doing. We, we, we wanted to grab their attention, so you've really got to get Craigslist posts that pops. Um, and the ways to do that is to make sure the cat has a name, and then list any unique features, usually in the subject line, if the cat's declawed, if it's a Siamese or a Persian or something like that, put that in the subject line. You need to give, the, give important information, so the cat's ID, where the cat is, and that the cat has a deadline. Uh, that's very important to put in there because otherwise people get very, very upset. Um, and if this cat is something that is someone you're considering bringing into the program, you really don't have the space, it's also an opportunity not only to post for an adopter, but maybe that person, maybe you'll be, you can post at the same time for a foster. So that's an opportunity there. So here's an example that we did um, for Snowy, uh, sorry, for Poppy, who's a snowy pure white cat and he's odd-eyed. Um, so we put that in the subject line. Um, we call out some information about why he's at the shelter, um, how sweet and loving he is, and then the shelter is full and Poppy needs to get out now to make room for more cats. It's really important. We found that photos are the key. If you don't have a photo, it's really hard to sell a cat. And so we try and take cute photos as well. Um, and then we've got various information about the shelter's adoption fees for that, that period and where, where he can be found. Um, and it's important to note, APA, the rescue team, were doing the Craigslist. This wasn't done by the shelter at the time. So this is a really good way to kind of get, get cats noticed. <clears throat> Some other, th other things to consider as you're doing your lists. If the cat seems to make, be making really good progress, um, maybe you, uh, you have the opportunity to ask the shelter to reevaluate the cat. I've seen cats that take um, um, a few days to just sort of come around and come out of the shell, and then they're the super lovey dovey, you know, slinky cat that wants to come out of the kennel and, and interact with you. So we've had situations where I'll go back to the shelter staff and I'll describe how wonderful this cat has become, and they'll go and reevaluate, and they take them off the list. They decide they're adoptable. Um, you can also work and see if there are other rescue partners. 
um, that might be w willing to work with you. So in our instance, we did work a lot of work with the Austin Siamese Rescue. We'd see if they had place, uh, places available before we would step in. So that was a, a nice partnership. <clears throat> Other tips are really good photos are really, really helpful. If it, it, um, it helps attract potential adopters, it helps with foster pleas, you can use them in marketing later. And then um, YouTube clips we found were even better. Um, if you put YouTube on a Craigslist post, everyone, you'll get tons of hits. So it, that's a really nice way to help market. And then you can use them in your marketing as well. OK, so um, I'm going to quickly, this is the last section, talk about volunteer recruiting and training and what worked and what didn't, really what didn't work. <clears throat> So we try to recruit people with cat experience, which seems kind of intuitive, but we've had people that have had absolutely no cat experience um, want to come and do that. So they take a, um, a, a little bit more training. Um, but typically, they're people that are really cat, cat lovers anyway. You need someone that's really detail-oriented, um, not only someone that can quickly look through reports, understand the shelter reports, and pull out the in important information, but also good at reporting what they're seeing in that detailed way. Uh, we're looking for people that can think outside the box, like, uh, like I was talking about with the stray cats or the owner surrender cats. And, um, and then we're looking for people that are responsive. So it's all very well if you know, you're on, the, on this uh, email alias, but if you take three days to respond, uh, that might be too late. So we need people that are kind of um, on, on their game and quick to respond. And we have now, with our training, um, required a three-hour commitment one day a week. Uh, which seems quite, quite sort of strict, but that really helps um, get the right kind of volunteer for our, for our program. So, when there were two of us, um, we were desperate for help, and, but we didn't have a lot of time to like, spend, spend training. So our, our initial thought was, well, just come along, you know, come along, Joe, and, and shadow me, like, sit here with me, and let's go through the list together, because, because that's, that's, that'll be the easiest for us. But what we really found is the learn as you go approach does not work. Um, we had a really high volunteer turnover. And the problems we ran into were that people became very overwhelmed. They were really panicked by deadlines, really panicked by deadlines, and they became really emotionally stressed. So the kinds of things um, just kind of to flag for you, uh, you, you probably the, the red flag goes off if you've got somebody that's saying, I'll foster, I'll foster every single cat on the list. Um, or you've got these frantic phone calls, uh, worrying about a cat on a deadline, that kind of thing. Um, sometimes you get people that become very hostile and angry towards the person that's making the final decision, and that's really hard for both people. And um, we've had people just kind of end up throwing their hands up and we're just walking away. In. So that does not work <laughs> in our experience. Um, the thing to remember with this rescue position is it's really stressful and it's a very lonely job. You're usually the only person doing it that day. You don't typically have a partner. And um, the evaluators, you're the, the first person that sees that cat and you get connected to that cat and you want to help save it. Um, they may feel like no one else understands and they may feel like they're the only, they're the only um, chance of survival for that cat. So there's a real attachment there that you, you need to recognize. Um, so. We took a different approach um, with training several years ago, and we went with a step-by-step -step approach. Um, so we, um, we found that this way really keeps a low volunteer turnover. We keep our volunteers working in the rescue team. So it requires a bit more um, time investment, but um, we basically present the information in small pieces. It gives them time to digest the process, and um, there's, there's less pressure. And it's also a good way to reinforce your protocols as you're going through the process. So our training strategy um, really uh, breaks it down. So the first time I meet the volunteer, so I'm the trainer as well, um, I'll, we'll just do basic introductions, like why are you interested in rescue? What kind of cat experience do you have? And then I'll give a little background about where I've come from. And then we just tour the shelter. I show them the cat areas. I show them you know, why these cats are at the shelter, and then we talk maybe about one cat that's on my list and the plan for that cat, and then we quit. <laughs> we go away. The next time they come back, they do the how to do evaluations training, which is what everyone wants to do. It's like the hands-on stuff. So how do you assess behavior? How do you look for medical? And that's really kind of, that pulls them in usually. They're really excited about that one, and we just 
really um, concentrate on the evaluation part. The third session is the more dry session, so it's understanding the reports. So understanding how the shelter reports and all their abbreviations and codes and where they position their deadlines, but also how um, we as a team do our reporting and what all our codes and abbreviations mean. <clears throat> the next session they do is I ask them to shadow a couple of different um, evaluators because everyone has a slightly different style and approach when they're working with the cats. And we've got one guy on our team, and I feel like some of the cats respond better to the, the guy than some of the women. So it's kind of nice to see, um, give the volunteer an opportunity to see other people interact with the cats. And then the last part, um, I ask them to lead the evaluation. So I'm physically there with them, supporting them if they have any questions, but they're the ones that kind of go in and do the evaluation. And we will recap. And then um, if we're all comfortable with the situation, then they become a fully-fledged evaluator. The other thing to try and um, feel more of a team is that we have, because we, you know, we each go in on a different day, we don't see each other, we only communicate by email, we try to have team meetings um, four, three or four times a year just to kind of have more of a social aspect and kind of um, keep that team atmosphere going. And there, I will leave it at questions.